Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Paolo Naso. I teach political science at La Sapienza University of Rome, not far from here. My gratitude to my good friend and colleague Roberto Cipriani, who kindly gave me the responsibility to chair uh, this session of this forum. Uh, it's really a privilege to be allowed to chair a so crucial um, session uh, of this meeting. Uh, the title of the session uh, is a little complicated to me because, in fact, I have two titles. One is more plain, and it is a title that you have in your uh, program, and uh, it sounds Christian churches. But I have, in a previous version of the program, a more challenging title that was Global Christianities. That is a little bit more challenging than the plain Christian churches. I don't know which of the two titles our main speaker uh, will adopt, but what is important is the, uh, the, the quality and the history and the CV of our main speaker. That is a um, very well-known professor, Jose Casanova, from the Georgetown University, Washington. Uh, I am sure that everybody in this room knows perfectly uh, Professor Casanova, and honestly, some of the president does know him, probably this is not the good place where to be, because it is very obvious that it is impossible, impossible to deal with the sociology of religions today without uh, referring to the gigantic work of Professor Casanova. Is, is the works have been really seminal, not in the United States only, but uh, worldwide. Uh, I could mention many, many titles, but uh, no doubt that the one they uh, left the more um, important footprint in our disciplines is a public religion in the modern world that was written in the 90s, when the idea and the conceptualization of post-secularization, of post-secularism, was not so strong as it is today. So it was a really uh, innovative work and approach, and we are really honored to have Professor Casanova uh, with us today. Uh, Professor Casanova has three distinct discussions, um, very well known uh, also. Uh, Professor Anthony Blasi from San Mary University, San Antonio, Texas, and we welcome uh, Professor uh, Blasi coming from the United States, a very well known person in uh, Italy and in Europe, Professor Garelli, University of Turin, very well known as a scholar, uh, researching about uh, Italian religions, the religions of the Italians. Uh, you can choose uh, the, the, the more appropriate uh, field, but it is essential to explore his uh, very important work to understand how the, uh, the religious profile of Italy changed in the last decades. Uh, last but not least, we have a colleague from the University of Zagreb. I am hesitant to pronounce his name since it is Sinisha Zinzrak. I do hope that I didn't go too bad, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, forgive me, I tried my best. Uh, the uh, colleague is really nice, and we already uh, discussed uh, this a little bit about his research and interest uh, um, on the religious uh, um, issues in, in Europe. Um, uh, Professor Casanova will have 40 minutes for his presentation. Uh, the three discussants will have uh, between 15 and 20 minutes maximum for their um, their interventions, then we will open the floor. From now, I deeply apologize with uh, all the speakers and the public if uh, at 10 to 5 I have to leave. Uh, I don't want to be impolite with you, but uh, unfortunately, a uh, long time ago, I had taken another commitment at the Antonianum um, and university, not far from here, and unfortunately at 10 to 5 I have to leave, but I know that uh, 
my friend and colleague, Professor Pace, uh, will uh, take the chair, and uh, I really thank him for his availability. So, uh, here we are. I think we are ready for uh, start, our start. Uh, Professor Casanova, the floor is yours, and welcome to Roma 3 and to this uh, very important forum. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Paolo, for the uh, flattering introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. For me, it's good morning from New York. Um, uh, let me thank, first of all, Roberto Cipriani and the organizers for their hard work in putting together this very, very important international forum on religions and for the kind invitation to present my reflections within it. Let me also express my regrets for not being able to be there in my beloved Rome with all of you. And also let me apologize publicly to the discussions of my lecture, my dear colleagues and friends, for having sent them my very rough and lengthy paper at the 11th hour, mea culpa. Actually, I thought I had 45 minutes, so I cut my lecture in half, so I will have to somehow cut also some parts of my lecture right now. As you can see, the title is not Unchristian Churches, but Unglobal Christianities, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox. I'm going to organize my presentation through an analysis of three common global patterns, which one can find transforming all three Christianities. Namely, first, the emergence of a new global paradigm of religious pluralism and religious denominationalism challenging the older nomenclature differentiating between true and false religions. And three, the radical challenges posed to all three by the drastic global transformation in sexual mores, gender relations, and sexual orientations. So first, the globalization of Christianity. I'm going to focus roughly on the last 50, 60 years from the 1960s to the present, which in my view marks the beginning of our contemporary global age and of the visible global transformations of the three Christianities while trying to play those developments in a longer comparative historical perspective. So the globalization of Catholic Christianity. It began with the global Catholic missionary expansion of the early modern age from the 16th to the 17th century Relevant is the fact that this was the era when Catholicism attained global reach from East Asia to North America, from the Philippines to South America, and a Simon or Simon Disfield has shown the era when Catholicism became a world religion. I've written a lot on this, so I'm going to be, I'm not going to go into the historical part because it has been published in, in my latest works. The 1960s are, of course, an arbitrary date marking the beginning in my the beginning of the contemporary global age. But in any case, as I've stressed frequently in my writings, well before Western-centric social scientists adopted the term globalization in the 1980s, the Catholic bishops gathered at the Second Vatican Council from October 1962 to December 1965, discovered and experienced the phenomenon of globalization as a sign of the times. This is evident when one reads the last three and arguably the most important documents of Vatican II. The Declaration and the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, Nostra Etate, Our Age, begins with the words, in our time, day by day, mankind is being drawn closer together and the ties between different peoples are becoming stronger. The Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, reiterates the same idea in the concluding paragraph when it recognizes, among the signs of the times, the fact that, quote, all nations are coming into even closer unity. Men of different cultures and religions are being brought together in closer relationship. The entire text of Gaudium et Spes the pastoral constitution and the church in the modern world can be read as a critical and prophetic discernment of both the positive dynamics and the negative consequences brought by contemporary globalization. 
quote, today the human race is involved in a new stage of history. Never has the human race enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources and economic power, and yet a huge proportion of the world's citizens are still tormented by hunger and poverty. Although the world of today has a very vivid awareness of its unity and of how one man depends on another in needful solidarity, it is most grievously torn into opposing camps by conflicting forces. True, there is a growing exchange of ideas, but the very words by which key concepts are expressed take on quite different meanings in diverse ideological systems." End of quote. The Council could adopt such a prescient global perspective because, as stressed by the German theologian Karl Rahner, this was the first truly global ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, a gathering of church fathers from all over the globe into a world church. One can understand the creative Durhemian effervescence that emerged out of such a three-year-long global encounter. But the gathering of over 2,000 about 2,000 Catholic bishops from all over the world was itself only made possible by the previous processes of missionary expansion during the previous historical phases of globalization. In any case, the Church at Vatican II was not a self-referential church, nor one still obsessed with its conflicts with European liberalism and Western secular modernity, which had rate which had raged throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. It was rather a global church open to the entire world in dialogue with global humanity that was scrutinizing prophetically global trends well before they became platitudes in global media or in social scientific jargon. The Catholic, Catholic Episcopal conferences that were forming every continent, I mean, in every country, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Oceania, etc. After Vatican II, further this process of globalization of Catholicism away from the national Catholicisms of the previous centuries. It deepened the awareness of being part of a global church, a process which is right now being pushed even further by the so called synodal processes taking place once again in every continent of the world before representatives of all the continental synods gathered jointly in Rome in the near future. This process of globalization of Catholic Christianity is accompanied by a clear de-Europeanization of Catholicism and a demographic shift first towards the Americas and then towards the global south. Rome remains the geographic and symbolic center of global Catholicism, but Rome has also been radically transformed by these processes. If you walk through the streets of Rome, you will see that all the male priests and female sisters, most of them that you meet are from the global south. Second, the globalization of Protestant Christianity. While the 16th century had been the golden age of global Catholic missions, the golden age of Protestant missionary expansion took place in the 19th century, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. In the first globalization, there had been practically no major Protestant overseas missionary outreach other than those within the British colonial settlements in North America and the Caribbean. In fact, the first Protestant mission initiatives came not from the established Protestant state churches, but from pieties dissenting evangelical groups. I'm not going to to basically the same process happen later uh, uh, in North America and in Germany, the beginning of the 19th century. <clears throat> At the beginning of the colonial rule in India, the East India Company had so no interest in promoting or supporting Christian missions. Eventually, however, under pressure from evangelical groups in Britain, the protection and promotion of Christian missionaries became part and parcel of the civilizing mission of the British Empire. The formation of the London Missionary Society in 1795 marks a turning point. 
by 1807, the society had opened its first mission in China in Guangzhou. By the mid middle of the 19th century, the European colonial powers were using the right to Christian evangelization and the protection of European missionaries as a pretext to military colonial interventions, opening borders and battering walls from Vietnam to Korea and from China to Japan. Once again, as in the first globalization, free trade, freedom of religion, and colonial military interventions became closely entangled. Yet, while the early modern global Catholic missions, particularly those pioneered by the Jesuits, were open to processes of accommodation to non-Western cultures, to indigenization, and to nativist enculturation, Protestant missions in the second phase of Western hegemonic globalization were much more iconoclastic in their rejection of any form of syncretism or accommodation to primitive, traditional, and idolatrous religion or culture. Following the May 4th movement in China in 1919, there was a significant turn towards the principle of indigenous enculturation in Catholic as well as in Protestant missionology in China. This trend was reinforced, reinforced by the process of global decolonization, particularly after World War II. It created the conditions for the renewal of a self-reflexive enculturation in the East throughout the global South. Throughout the 19th century, American evangelical Christianity developed its own home and foreign missions. Missionaries followed the expanding boundaries of the United States and continued to Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. North America for Christ was an evangelical missionary call tied to the imperial manifest destiny, at first restricted like the Monroe Doctrine to the Americas. After victory in the 1898 Spanish-American War over Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, American evangelical missions also became global. But the indigenization of Protestant Christianity in the Global South did not find its consolidation and explosive growth until the 1960s. The trajectory of Latin American Protestant Christianity is in this respect paradigmatic. Although there, there had been, since the 19th century, historical Protestant communities in Latin America, primarily Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian, they had been unable to establish a self-reproducing dynamic of endogenous growth, and with some exceptions in Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, they had remained tiny minorities. As David Martin pointed out in his 1990 pioneering study of the Latin American Pentecostal Revolution, tanks of fire, quote, the takeoff came in the late 60s. In Martin's own words, quote, what historical Protestantism has lacked and still lacks is precisely the capacity to go native. Indeed, it is the incapacity of Protestantism hitherto to cross, to cross cultural divides and go native that has historically given the edge to Catholicism or led to separatist native churches as in Africa. This capacity to go native and to cross cultural, ethnic, and racial boundaries is precisely the great intrinsic advantage of Pentecostalism, which explains its global expansion today, not only in Latin America, but also in Africa and Asia, in places where the expansion of Protestant Christianity accompanying British or American imperialism had failed to take indigenous roots before. As I wrote in my 2000 presidential address, of the American uh, uh, um, sociology of, Association for the Sociology of Religion. Religion, the New Millennium and Globalization was the title. The transformation of contemporary Catholicism illustrates the opportunities which the process of globalization offers to a transnational religious regime with a highly centralized structure and an imposing transnational network of human, institutional, and material resources which feels therefore confident in its ability to thrive in a relatively open global system of religious regimes.
contemporary Pentecostal Christianity, by contrast, may serve to illustrate the equally favorable opportunities which globalization offers to a highly decentralized religion with no historical link to tradition and no territorial roots or identity, and which therefore can make itself at home anywhere in the globe where the spirit moves. End of quote. African Pentecostalism is as local, indigenous, as autonomous and autonomous as its Latin American counterpart. The same could be said about Pentecostal Christianity in Korea, China, and most recently in India. As we are entering the third millennium, we are witnessing the end of hegemonic European Christianity due to a dual process of advanced secularization in post-Christian Europe and of the increasing globalization of a deterritorialized and decentered Christianity. Thus, the thousand-year-old association between Christianity and Western Euro European civilization is coming to an end. Western Europe is less and less the core of Christian civilization and Christianity in its most dynamic forms today is less and less European or even Western. My second topic, the globalization, oh, excuse me, the third, uh, the globalization of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Parallel to the overseas colonial expansion of Western European powers in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a territorial colonial expansion of Orthodox Russia eastward and to the Pacific and the border of the Chinese Empire. This expansion itself has to be viewed within the context of the competition of the three Romes. The conquest of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks in 1453 marked the fall of Byzantium, the second Rome. This fall triggered both the search of new routes to the Indies by the Iberian Catholic powers and the proclamation of Moscow as the third Rome. In 1492, the very same year of Columbus' arrival in the Americas, Metropolitan Sosima of Muscovy called the Grand Duke Ivan III, quote, the new Tsar Constantine of the new Constantinople, Moscow. Scholars in Moscow explained the fall of Constantinople as the divine punishment for the sin of the union with the Catholic Church in the Council of Florence. The doctrine of the Third Rome implied that Moscow had become the heir of the Second Rome in its dual dimension of imperial sovereignty and ecclesiastical supremacy. Moscow rulers, Moscow rulers adopted the title of Russian Tsars, claiming the inheritance of both Kiev and Rus and Byzantium, while the Patriarch of Moscow assumed the title of Metropolitan of Kiev and all Rus, claiming not only autocephaly, but supremacy over Eastern Orthodoxy. The captivity of the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople and of all Orthodox churches in the Balkans and the Middle East under the Ottoman Empire seemed to justify the ideological fiction of the Third Rome, sacralizing the emergence of the newly denominated Holy Russian Empire. Yet, as in the case of the Protestant colonial empires, the 16th century colonial territorial expansion of the Russian Empire eastwards was not accompanied by any serious project of evangelization of the politically subjugated peoples. Looking at the Orthodox world during the second phase of globalization, one can observe two different and distinct dynamics. One is the expansion of the missionary activity within the Russian Empire and beyond throughout the 19th century. The other is the process of independence of Orthodox countries from the Ottoman Empire and the dynamic of reproduction of autocephalous Orthodox churches now tied to the globalization of nationalism. For Russian Orthodoxy, the second phase of globalization begins symbolically with a mission to Alaska in 1792. The most important figure in the Russian missionary movement of the 19th century was Innocent Benyaminov, who spent 45 years as missionary in Alaska and Siberia. In 1868, Innocent was elected 
as Metropolitan of Moscow, where he established the Russian Orthodox Mission Society, modeled after Catholic and Protestant precursors. At its height, the Mission Society had over 16,000 members throughout Russia and sent and supported hundreds of missionaries in Siberia, the Pacific Coast, Alaska, Japan, China, and Korea. The Bolshevik Revolution brought an end to this Russian missionary tradition, although by creating exiled intellectual and theological diasporas in Paris and New York, it also contributed in its own way to the globalization of Russian Orthodox thought. Under the rum millet system of the Ottoman Empire, all Orthodox subjects were considered part of the same millet. Religion rather than ethnicity or language was the primary group identity in the millet system. The ecumenical patriarch was recognized as ethnarch of all Orthodox subjects. The globalization of nationalism following the American and French revolutions undermined the millet system. Nation building processes emerged in all Orthodox lands that brought together the dynamics of political nationalism seeking independent statehood, statehood in the dynamics of religious communities aiming to establish autocephalous national churches. Those processes, excuse me, churches no longer under the jurisdiction of the ecumenical patriarch. Those processes were aided by the geopolitical power of the Russian Empire with the help of the Russian Orthodox Church, which increasingly viewed itself as the global protector of Orthodox Christianity against the Ottomans as well as against Western powers. Within the autocephalous churches of the Balkans, there is no much evidence of any missionary impulse until the emergence in the late 1950s of the International Orthodox Youth Movement, Sindesmos. This missionary awakening was led by the young theologian Anastasios Janulatos. In the 1960s, Janulatos pioneered an Orthodox mission in East Africa. In the 1980s, he became acting Archbishop of East Africa, where he helped the development of the indigenous Orthodox Church in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, establishing the first Orthodox seminary in Africa. One could rightly view Janulatus' global Orthodox missionary vision as a symbolic threshold to the third phase of globalization for Orthodoxy, in the same way that the Second Vatican Council constitutes the symbolic phase of colonial Catholicism and the modern phase of different types of national Catholicism, and in the same way that the global expansion of Pentecostalism in the 1960s inaugurates a new global phase, a new global phase of Protestant Christianity. Looking at the contemporary globalization of orthodoxy, one can observe the re-emergence of the second and the third Rome and the global stage. After almost half a millennium of quiet captivity under the Ottoman and under Turkey, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople has regained some stature on the global stage. His leadership is primos inter pares within the Orthodox world, most visible in his role in trying to organize the great and holy synod of the Orthodox Church in singular, his important role in global ecumenical dialogue with the papacy and with other religions, and his pastoral and prophetic voice on global issues such as the environment that resonates beyond an Orthodox audience. After decades of intra-Orthodox negotiations and preparations, the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church convened in Crete in June 2016. The Sinos agenda included the Sinos agenda included the mission of the Orthodox Church in today's world, the Orthodox diaspora, the proper regulation of church autonomy, that is autocephaly, and the relations of the Orthodox Church with the rest of the Christian world. In short, it was supposed to bring about the adjournamento of global orthodoxy. But the boycott of the council by the Russian Orthodox Church, along with the churches of Antioch, Bulgaria, 
in, Georg in Georgia and the absence of the Orthodox Church in America laid bare the serious divisions within global orthodoxy. Most obviously, it revealed the conflict for supremacy between the Second and the Third Rome, which is raging literally all over the world today in the Americas, in Africa, and in Asia. After the fall of the Soviet Union, in alliance with the Putin regime, re-emerged with its claim of canonical territorial jurisdiction over the Ruski Mir, and with its claim of supremacy over the Orthodox world as primus inter pares. But the crisis in Ukraine, caused by the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, generated the conditions for the emergence of a newly reconstituted autocephalous Orthodox Church of Ukraine under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarch. For the Moscow Patriarchate, the loss of Ukraine means the end of the Ruski Mir project. My second topic, emergence of a new global paradigm of religious pluralism, the system of world religions, global denominationalism. All Christian global missionary enterprises that accompany the various waves of Western colonial expansion took for granted the traditional monotheistic nomenclature that emerged with the mosaic distinction between true and false religion, which was adapted in different ways by the different branches of Christianity and Islam. In the last century, there has emerged a global world system of religions, which has undermined the old monotheist nomenclature. It is global, like the world capitalist system or the world system of nation states, but it has different dynamics. The structure of our own conference this International Forum on Religions is a testimony to the emergence of such a system. The process of constitution of a global system of religions can best be understood as a process of global religious den denominationalism at the level of global civil society, whereby also called war religions are redefined and transformed in contraposition to the secular through interrelated reciprocal processes of particularistic differentiation, universalistic claims, and mutual recognition. Each world religion claims its universal right to be unique and different thus its particularism, while at the same time presenting itself globally as a universal path for all of humanity. Global denominationalism is emerging as a self-regulated system of religious pluralism and mutual recognition of religious groups in global civil society. One of the paradoxes of our contemporary global age is the Catholic Church, which for over a thousand years had positioned itself as the sole embodiment of the true religion, as the Una Santa Catholica et Apostolica Ecclesia, embedded in the principle extra ecclesia nulla salus, today perhaps more explicitly than any other religion uh, uh, is at the global forefront of interreligious encounter and dialogue. Protestant Christianity was the first religion that had to come to terms with the phenomenon of explosive internal religious pluralism within its own tradition. Today there is a cleavage between liberal forms of Protestant Christianity committed to ecumenism and interreligious recognition and dialogue with all world religions, and those fundamentally sectarian forms of Protestant Christianity, which are still militantly opposed to idolatry or to poverty. A similar cleavage is emerging within global orthodoxy. Ukraine is at the center of this conflict which tragically has turned into a violent war. On the one hand, in terms of practice of religious pluralism, Ukraine today presents one of the most paradigmatic cases of institutionalization of religious pluralism in any European society. Indeed, Ukraine is the first European society to institutionalize a system of religious denominationalism. 
I've written several papers over this in my in the last years. On the other hand, the hegemonic orthodox ecclesiastical theology of canonical territory counters the model of religious pluralism with the claim that canonic, canonically there can be only a legitimate bishop in any city and that therefore there cannot be multiple canonical Christian churches within Ukrainian territory. This principle is behind the present system between the Ecumenical Patriarch and the Moscow Patriarchate as to which of them has the legitimate canonical jurisdiction over the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. The same principle is behind the political theology, ecclesiology of the Ruski Mir, which was attacked by Orthodox theologians in a letter signed by over 400 of them, which claims that the Russian Orthodox Church and the Moscow Patriarchate have legitimate canonical jurisdiction not only over the territory of Ukraine, but also over the Slavic people in Ukraine who have no right to religious freedom and must belong confessionally to the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church still uses the old names, Unities for Ukrainian Greek Catholics, Kismatics for Ukrainian Orthodox, and Heretics for Ukrainian Protestants. Finally, the moral revolution in gender and sexual relations and the church's responses. Turheim defines sociology as the science of morality. And that's why the drastic global transformation in gender and sexual morality since the 60s is one of the most pressing sociological issues of our day. The relationship between societal and church morality throughout the history of Christianity has been a complex and mutually reciprocal one. Roughly, from the time of the Constantinian establishment till the 18th century, the predominant direction of influence was marked by repeated attempts of the church to Christianize the seculum, that is, to make secular society and the people living with it, within it Christian. But since the 18th century, the direction of influence has been reversed and increasingly modern secular societal morality has been the one challenging informing and influencing church morality. The key, principle, key principles governing modern societal morality have been <laughs> self-evident truths which were formulated most succinctly by the American Revolution, namely that all men, and we would add today all women, are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The radical change produced by the modern democratic and sexual revolutions and the fundamental transformations in gender relations and gender roles, which both entail, present a particularly difficult challenge to the sacred claims of all religious traditions. Not surprisingly, the politics of gender and gender equality are central to politics everywhere and religion is thoroughly and intimately implicated in the politics of gender. The discourses of feminism and secularism have become intertwined today in the same way as communism and atheism became intertwined in the 19th century. Gender has become in this respect the preeminently contested social question where religion has been thrown willingly or unwillingly into the vortex of the global contestation. Traditional religious establishments tend to view feminist agendas and particularly the very notion of gender as a historically contingent, socially constructed and therefore changeable reality as the greatest threat not only to their religious traditions and their moral authoritative claims, but to their very idea of a sacred or divinely ordained natural order inscribed either in natural law, sharia, or some right way universally valid for all times. At the Second Vatican Council, the Church Fathers embraced theological developmental principles grounded in the historicity of divine revelation, incarnation, and continuous historical unfolding of the divine plan 
plans of salvation for humanity that require the church, church's careful discernment of the signs of the times. Actually, the same historicist and developmental recognition appears most poignantly in the section that directed to women in the closing speech of the council when the council fathers asserted, I quote, at this moment, when the human race is undergoing so deep a transformation, the hour is coming, in fact has come, when woman, the vocation of woman is being achieved in its fullness, the hour in which woman acquires in the world an influence, an effect, and a power never hitherto achieved. This was in 1965. Yet this prophetic vision of the unprecedented transformation in gender relations which humanity was experiencing did not have the transformative consequences one should have expected in the life of the church after the council. Indeed, on issues of gender and sexual moral theology, the Catholic Church, the Catholic hierarchy, since the publication of the encyclical Humane Vitae in 1968, has reasserted a traditionalist ontological conception of human nature and of human biology based on the essentialist conception of an ahistorical, unchanging, and universally valid natural law. Such a traditional ontological conception is increasing in tension with the historicist conception of human moral development upheld by the social sciences, as well as with the conception of a changing biological historical nature informed by the new evolutionary life sciences. The issue here is not one of moral relativism, as a matter of arbitrary individual choice or preference, but that of a class between fundamental sacred moral values in the Durhamian sense of the term. Theologically, any religious community has the right and the duty to uphold what it considers a divinely ordained sacred injunction or moral norms. Sociologically, however, the question is how long any religious tradition, particularly a Catholic one, can resist the adoption of a new moral value when a near universal consensus concerning the sacred character of such a value emerges in society. To denounce modern moral developments as a reversion to paganism or a rampant relativism is to misunderstand modern historical developments. Sociologically, in reaction to the Catholic Church's official defense of a traditional exposition on gender issues and a singularly obsessive focus on sexual moral issues, one can observe throughout the Catholic world a dual process of female secularization and erosion of the church's authority and sexual morality. Female secularization is probably the most significant factor in the drastic secularization of Western European societies since the 1960s. We are witnessing, on the one hand, a church hierarchy which evinces an almost obsessive focus on defending traditional sexual morality, and on the other hand, a majority of Catholic faithful in the secular world who not only ignore the moral injunctions of the hierarchy, but feel increasingly comfortable dissociating their religion and their sexuality. This radical dissociation of private sexuality from religion is leading to a radical secularization of the private sphere of individual consciousness that parallels the secularization of politics and of the public sphere. The problem is aggravated by the still ongoing scandal of the widespread clerical sexual abuse throughout the Catholic world. The church insists that it has always considered any form of sexual abuse a sin, but it took the church a long time to comprehend that supposedly permissive and liberated modern secular societies which had apparently abandoned all sexual inhibitions were the ones that had turned the forgivable sin of sexual abuse of the weak into a serious crime, indeed into a moral taboo in the Durhamian 
sense of the term. The church has also failed to understand that this is one of the great moral achievements of feminism, namely to protect the bodies of women and children from profanation, thus enhancing the sacred dignity of those who had traditionally been exposed to abuse by patriarch, patriarchal mores. The moral gap is most evident in attitudes towards same-sex marriage, something that was considered immoral, unnatural, criminal, and even pathological by all modern societies only 60 years ago, today is accepted largely as normal. Younger, younger generations do not understand all the fuss around this issue. For them, what is immoral is the attitude of the churches denying gay individuals their sacred right to marriage, which they consider part of the fundamental equal rights to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Yet suddenly, the unexpected election of Pope Francis changed dramatically the nature of the debate, the official discourse coming from the hierarchy, and what appeared to be an acrimonious and growing injunction between church and secular world and issues of gender. The Pope himself has repeatedly mentioned that one should not expect any change in doctrine or teaching from his pontificate. But the changing in tone and the relegation of issues of gender and sexual morality from the core to the periphery of church teaching and the foregrounding of the Sermon on the Mount was in itself most relevant. It helped to reestablish the values of the gospel in the hierarchy of truths of Christian morality. Francis' papacy also put a stop to what was emerging as a new coalition of traditionalist Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christianity in defense of the family and traditional Christian values. This so-called moralist international has been implicated in the mobilization of culture wars all over the world. The post-secular conflicts project led by Christina Steckel at the University of Innsbruck has documented the Russian offensive coordinated jointly by Putin's regime and the Moscow Patriarchate in support of a transnational European moral conservative alliance against the liberalism, secular humanism, democratic human rights, and gender rights platform represented by the European Union. Tragically, the war in Ukraine offers evidence of the, the catastrophic consequences of the weaponization of the moral culture wars. As the statements of Patriarch Kirill since the beginning of the war make evident, the war is not only a holy war of holy Russia to conquer Ukraine and to reestablish the world of Rus, or the Rus Kimir. It is also a metaphysical fight between good and evil, these are the words of Patriarch Kirill, fought by Messianic Russia in defense of traditional Christian values against the decadent West. Modern societies have learned to live with religious pluralism. It is an open question whether modern societies will be able to learn to live with competing public moralities, or as Durham claimed, societal integration is only possible when one of the contending public moralities supplants the old one. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I was a few minutes above my allotted time. Thank you, Professor Casanova, also for being so precise in your timing and for sharing, sharing quite a quite a very interesting new approach. Uh, what you define the new paradigm, and we were used to other definition of new paradigm when we were speaking of uh, secularization and post-secularization. Now you're offering a new paradigm in the sense of exploring the internal pluralism. Uh, inside of the religious families. And thank you for highlighting the lines of fracture that uh, affect uh, the three major communities that you uh, explore this afternoon, the Catholic, the Protestant, and uh, the, the Orthodox. Real lines of fracture. And uh, it is very, very powerful, I think, that you ended your presentation focusing on gender 
and gender equality, indicating this uh, exact topic as the most challenging for uh, the Christian religious communities, uh, for the new Christianities, global Christianities. Probably we have to uh, adapt our analysis, analysis and our mentality to explore these new internal uh, dynamics, uh, new fractures internal to the different uh, Christian components. Thank you very much, Professor Casanova, for this uh, uh, contribution. I now leave the floor to the first discussant, that is uh, Professor Blasi. For technical reasons, Professor, I invite you to take my place because this is the only possibility to uh, be shown by the camera. So please come here. First, I wish to apologize for my informal attire. Uh, United Airlines decided that New Jersey was a good place for my luggage. Uh, second, I want to thank Professor um, Cipriani for, uh, and, and the organizing committee for putting this together. It's a very uh, important conference. Uh, in old age, I have developed a visual impairment, uh, so uh, Professor uh, Tabori, uh, as uh, Ephraim Tabori has agreed to uh, present my response to Professor Casanova's presentation uh, to you. Professor Casanova has given us an important and interesting account of the contemporary Christian churches. In the present response, I, Professor Blasi, provide some general context by describing contemporary social forces that affect not only Christianity or even religion in general, but other institutions as well. One contemporary force is globalization. While it has many consequences for faith traditions, a notable one is a semi-detachment from transnational organizations. In George Simmel's wording, it is a matter of wider and narrower social circles. The major faith traditions in the Christian world take the form of wider social circles. People have access to those traditions. However, in local congregations or even in congregate organizations that are not open to free entry, these latter range from prayer groups and chapters of conservative or progressive organizations to well-funded political groups that associate religious ideologies with secular ones. While congregations are geographically local, other narrow social circles may inhabit semi-closed communication networks. There is a dialectic in each case between the wider and narrower social circles. As the wider circle increases in its influence, so also does the narrower circle, albeit among different sets of people. Thus the progressive stances taken by the nominal leaders in various nations, by the Vatican and by the World Council of Churches may not be in agreement with or even relevant to what parishioners and congregants hear or believe in parishes and congregations. The ideological interest groups may actively oppose authoritative statements from the highest level of authorities of the transnational churches. Intermediate organizations, such as regional conferences and bishops or superintendents, may be caught in the cross currents between organizational leadership and the smaller congregations or networks. They either become fields of intra-organizational conflict or venues of compromised discourse and non-committal statements. Sometimes movements among congregations wrest power in key denominational positions and take control of theological schools believed to be too liberal. The situation is quite different with, dependent, with independent non-denominational congregations. They are cases of narrow social circles, but their dialectic is not with the denominational leadership or other transnational Or other, okay. 
Their dialectic is not with a denominational leadership or other transnational religious organizations, but with non-religious cosmopolitanism. Their members may be suspicious of science and expertise in general or of foreign influences. They are likely to reject higher criticism in biblical studies and simply read a translation of the Christian Bible literally. One aspect of their tension with science is a magical view of daily life in which God or saints are called upon to cure maladies and solve financial problems. Subnations within nation states sometimes use Christianity to provide legitimation in everyday life or their collective identity. This was once the case in the pillarized society of Belgium. It is the case more recently among African Americans. The more it is the case that one's public identity is distant from that of the nation state, the greater one's participation in one's tradition may be. In this case, Christian tradition. This is one theoretical avenue to understanding Christian identity movements. Thus, one, while some evangelicals in the U.S. favor the nationalist polities of the state of Israel on eschatological grounds, others emphasize the identity aspect of Christian identity and exhibit anti-Jewish prejudice. The former see the re-establishment of the Jerusalem temple as a prelude to the end times, while the latter see all non-Christians as unsaved heaven. Sometimes, subnationalities such as French Canada compete with Christianity. And there is the classic case of the formation of Italy in the 19th century as a non-confessional state. More recently, the very merger of East Germany freed from Soviet domination into a more legitimate German state occurred as Christianity declined even from levels that obtained in the former officially atheist East Germany. And in the curious case of Poland, Catholic Sunday mass attendance declined once the nation was free of Soviet domination, even as the indigenous political establishment professes a Catholic identity. At the level of institutions, the precarity of identity may also be understood as social margin marginality. Religion, education, and family may receive verbal honorifics, but big business, big military, and big government may really matter. One's religion may remain unsophisticated while life goes on. One thinks of the silly, simplistic homilies to which the clergy must resort in order to reach their congregants. Religion is also under pressure to avoid controversy, much in the manner of education, and people may be transferred away geographically for business or professional reasons, in the course of which good congregational experiences may be exchanged for mere Sunday routine. At a personal level, however, Christian commitment may actually strengthen in the interiority of the individual, irrespective of its lack of sophistication, low level of theological grounding, and superficial ritual observance. In the situation of marginality, religion may turn up renewed in surprising places with people taking up serious biblical and theological studies in midlife. This is because the typical Christian consciousness and engagement with the world from an outside perspective has an elective affinity with marginality. Much of the world has experienced an internal migration of people from rural hinterlands to urban centers, which also occurs across national boundaries. There are often other push and pull factors in international migration. The rise of middle-class populations, for example, draws people into contexts where educational and employment opportunities are available. With the leaders of some nations wishing to build empires through conquest, wars will continue to be a major push factor. For Christians, the resultant migration often means that enchantment-oriented people come to live in disenchanted contexts. Denominations, congregations, and networks that seek to maintain enchantment in otherwise disenchanted societies 
consequently experience growth, especially in urban areas, for a generation or two. The question of generations is a significant one. Denominational schools have come to serve upper middle class to middle class to upper class clientele in many places, leaving families as the sole bearers of religious tradition for most people. New generations frequently do not even receive religious socialization in the school, and families may not bring their young children to Sunday services. In the case of migrants from enchanted to disenchanted society, lo locales, the preservation of an enchanted consciousness may succeed for only one or two generations after immigration. Recent research on the congregations of San Antonio, a growing city in southern South Central Texas, United States, having about one and a half million residents, identified 80 Latino congregations in 2010 one Episcopal, Episcopal Anglican, Anglican Communion, five United Methodist, eight Roman Catholic, 17 Baptist, 49 non-denominational. While the Catholic parishes were no doubt larger than the others, and while the total number of eight does not take account of the many principally English-speaking Catholic parishes that have separate services in Spanish for first-generation immigrants from Latin America, a large number of small non-denominational Latino congregations indicates a significant trend. As of 2018, there were 60. Information on these congregations is difficult to obtain, but they appear to be predominantly fundamentalist or Pentecostal. Some urban areas throughout the world are receiving migrants from all continents except Antarctica, known as global cities. They feature congregations of Christian denominations from far away homelands. In San Antonio, one finds Orthodox churches from the Balkans, for example, and denominations from India. Contemporary organized life in the secular realms has pyramids of success and failure. The proportion of people who fail in some sense and are at the bottom of the pyramid is much larger than those who succeed and are at the top. In education, for example, all students who do not earn terminal degrees need to be convinced that they are not interested in further studies or that they are not talented enough to persist. This can be an underlying factor in the widespread distrust of science, but it can also stoke an underlying resentment. The same pattern occurs in sports. There are many more who do not compete successfully than those who do. In fact, the vast majority of sport enthusiasts are sidelined as spectators. Politics is similarly pyramidal. The mass of contenders wish to be counted among the few, but being so counted is an arithmetical impossibility. The entertainment industry features a star system. Every star is per definition a rarity. And the business world is notable for a few conglomerates either buying out small marginal businesses or putting them out of business altogether. Religious organizations themselves sometimes replicate the patterns set by business. For example, mega churches feature a star system for their clergy, and they are known to drive smaller congregations out of business. The mega churches provide a consoling discourse that adjusts their members to contemporary pyramidal life. And it's not only the megachurches that gain popularity by adjusting their congregations to the structured failure that their members experience. Religious discourse often dismisses criteria of advancement. The consoling happy talk does not eliminate the underlying anger, but does put it on pause. Having said the word pause, I will pause just to inform people who joined late that I am reading the response of Professor Anthony Blasek. <laughs> the underlying anger pushes toward expression and the moral aspect of Christian religion enables such expressions to occur. Doubtful claims that sexual minorities are immoral whip up angry expressions in political activism, usually outside the church premises. The very format in which such claims are made allows for no discussion a Sunday homily is not like this form, 
where lecturers receive comments from alternative perspectives, the homilies are simply presented. The American sociologist Robert Park distinguished between the crowd and the public. The crowd's discourse would be detached from any community. A response to some stimulus would simply sweep through an assemblage of people, riding a wave of emotion. The public's discourse, in contrast, would entertain differences and nuances attached to a community that possesses various knowledge bases and interests. Crowds are notable for their ephemeral nature, their temporal unanimity. Publics are marked by compromises and settlements. I would maintain that Christian assemblies are more like crowds than publics. In the world of small villages in the past, congregations were community-like, but the typical contemporary urban and more often suburban congregations assemble anonymous attenders together. The social dynamics of congregations resemble the side of radio of a, the, um, the side of a radio or television audience. Radio has become a medium of a free-floating Christian discourse in a typical program. Commentators engage in a conversation in which they discuss what they seem, what they deem to be the issues of the day, doing so in the name of Christian morality. While they do not shout over the microphones or thump their desks with their fists, they express no little malice toward opponents whom they generally do not name. They dismiss alternative views as unprincipled, uninformed, and irrational. Their radio listeners are led into a rhetorical world that has little to do with everyday life. Listeners who are taken up with the rhetoric, rhetoric are in fact detached from any practical or economic interest which would be properly theirs. Classical colonialism ended in the mid 20th century. In its place, we find an attempt by Russia to, conquer, to conquest, conquest its neighbors and by China to establish a system of economic colonialism. What I wish to point out is that apart from the 21st century imperialism of Russia and China, there is an aftermath from the colonialism of previous centuries. Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Britain, Britain France, and Belgium no longer administer overseas colonies, but there is a non-indigenous Christianity in the lands that they once administered. I wish to call attention to the Africanist Christian churches and the independent, ecstatic Protestant churches of Brazil. These and churches like them become increasingly interesting when they establish congregations for their members who migrate to the first world, the world of the former colonialists. And moreover, when they make converts in that first world, where they become instances of churches of enchanted people in disenchanted environments. In North America, an aftermath of colonialism is the effort to civilize the native people. In Canada, the French government manda mandated mandated the removal of children from their families and required them to board in residential schools run by the churches. In the United States, there was a similar residential school system, though not run by the churches. Recently, the Canadian churches have been apologizing for their involvement in this cultural genocide. As the colonies gained their independence as nation states, the colonial missions became constituent churches of their respective denominations. This began in the 19th century when a number of the former colonies adopted the rhetoric, if not always the reality, of constitutional democracies having charters of human rights. <laughs> Among them, Canada, the United States, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile became immigrant nations with largely Southern and Eastern European immigrants forming working classes. It is also the case that perhaps the most badly treated colony of the British Empire Ireland sent large numbers of migrants to the Western Hemisphere. The immigrant churches often allied themselves with the labor movement and working class aspirations. This alliance is fading at present since the former working classes have taken on a middle class status. The current Roman Catholic Pope, who is the descendant of Southern European migrants to Argentina, 
reflects this heritage. Meanwhile, the churches of transnational denominations and nations that achieved independence after World War II have similarly become constituent churches of their respective denominations. In some cases, they have provided leadership marked by conservative theological stands, most notably in the Anglican communion, communion. And as people migrate from the emergent nations to the first world, they form congregations of a conservative caste that rival local liberal congregations. Interestingly, some churches in the Anglican communion have established conservative dioceses in the United States as rivals to the diocese of the long established Episcopal church. In the past, from the 16th century onward, different Christian denominations sought to enforce doctrinal uniformity among their officials and members. Roman Catholicism centered on scholasticism, while the Reformation churches centered on sola scriptura. The situation has changed considerably. Professors of scripture and theology teach in consortia in many cases, in which scholars from different denominational backgrounds participate. Even those who are not in consortia are similarly placed with respect to their churches. They have more in common in their training and experience than they have with local pastors and congregants who are involved in an ex la, um, ex theola. Consequently, differences in biblical interpretation and theology occur increasingly among a long. Your time is expiring. Yes, what do I do? Your time is expiring. We try to keep it twenty minutes for each uh, panelist. I would like to hope that you think that I am intellectually superior and able to prepare this presentation. This is <laughs> Professor Blasi's presentation. So, okay. I just wanted to let you know that a 20 minutes worth of the time that we allocated <laughs> for each panelist. So I was ordered by Professor to play. <laughs> Five minutes more? No, three minutes. Three minutes. I will read fast. <laughs> Consequently, differences in biblical interpretation and theology occur increasingly along wide social circles versus small social circle formations, or phrased otherwise between cosmopolitans and locals. They do not differ predictably along denominational lines. The tendency of Christians to be involved in their churches more extensively when the political order is lacking in legitimacy results in a pattern in which less piety is found in democracies that promote the welfare of their citizens and more piety is found in autocracies that promote principally the welfare of their rulers. Let me be clear, the churches do not legitimate auto autocratic regimes, at least not with much success should they attempt to do so. Rather, they legitimate civilized conduct far from the corridors of power. The consequences of this for the content of Christianity in autocratic settings is a withdrawal from major social issues and an emphasis on personal morality. <laughs> Enchanted people within disenchanted contexts maintain a res residual God to whom one appeals when ordinary action cannot solve problems. Ecstatic prayer displaces pragmatic, especially collective action. People usually succeed in addressing individual problems since they are well practiced in doing so. However, large scale economic injustices, overseas wars, and the limited experience of oncoming death may bring on escapism. God becomes a comforting counselor, if not the matter of a magic show. The underlying anger that emerges from structured failure can populate the Christian world with the enemies, racial and ethnic groups other than one's own, are potential candidates toward which hostility might be directed. Religions other than one's own become defined as threats. As noted, sexual minorities are often targeted. Such targeting is mostly verbal in nature. Most angry Christians or Christian nationalists do not engage in violence. However, the vicious rhetoric stemming from structured failure may be seized upon by those who are prone to violence. Finally, the free-floating discourse of the Christian crowd frees expressions of nominally Christian discourse from any concern with real people. Even in cases of good works, it may be a matter of contributing to a charity without appreciating what, necessity, what necessitates charity <laughs> in the first place. One speaks with the discourse of charity, 
but does not take the trouble to imagine the life course of needy people. One gives money or serves in a soup kitchen, which helps define oneself as a worthy person. Not all of these departures from the earliest content of Christianity are unique to the contemporary era. Some of them emerged as early as the fourth century. What is proper to the con contemporary world is their reemergence and persistence in the contemporary world. I end by saying it is not the role of sociologists to tell ecclesiastical policymakers what to do about them, but it is our role to portray them according to their true nature. And I remind you that while I would hope that you would think that I am intellectually ability to able to provide such an insightful response to the wonderful presentation by Professor Casanova, these are the words of Professor Anthony Blasi. Thank you for the author. To the reader, I again apologize deeply for being so rude to interrupt, but I think that time is important in such a busy and crowded conference. So please forgive me for my intervention in interrupting you. The second speaker, the second panelist, who will react to the presentation of Professor Casanova. Um, I already introduced the Professor Gorelli as University of Turin. Yes, I wanted to be sure that he was the second panelist, and not the last one. Uh, again, he will have 20 minutes to react to Professor Casanova. Please, Professor Gorelli, the floor is yours. Yeah, and again, move to the camera. Uh, due to uh, to the short uh, time, I'm I'm just put uh, put on the table a couple of suggestions for uh, further uh, discussion. Um, the first one deals with the globalization of Christianity. Um, in my uh, perspective of uh, Catholicism. As Casanova mentioned, the missionary expansion of the last centuries has favored the rise of a global Catholicism, which can be observed especially in the second half of the last century. Let me briefly list what are the indicators of this process of globalization of Catholicism? The Second Vatican Council was the first gathering of church fathers from around the world into a worldwide church, opened the uh, whole world and in dialogue with the global humanity. The establishment on, of Episcopal conference, conferences on all continents going beyond the perspective of national Catholicism. Third, the establishment of Synod of the Universal Church and Synod of the Continental Churches, and the setup of College of Cardinals that better represent the presence of the Catholic in the world compared to the past. But in Casanova discourse, these internal changes within the Catholic framework, organizational and administrative changes, are related to the great changes in taking place in the different continents where Catholicism is present. First, the demographic shift first to the Americas and then to the global south. And second and foremost, the secularization of Western countries, especially in Europe. Two trends, which seem to tell us that contemporary Catholicism takes on a more global character. Rome, then, according to Casanova, remains the geographic and symbolic center of global Catholicism, but it has also been radically transformed by these process, processes. Casanova thesis is plausible in several respects. 
Catholicism certainly has a more planetary character today than in the past. I wonder, however, if we face with a Catholicism that is more global in form than in substance. Because the model of Catholicism that prevails in the world is still that of the Western matrix, of the Hellenistic culture, which does not seem to take much account to the need of, to embody the Christian faith in context marked by other life conditions and cultural traditions. It is the famous question of the inculturation of the faith in different contexts. That is one of the tasks of an outgoing church, as the Pope would like it to be, but which would require a strong theological investment in the different continent and the possibility to be autonomous of both the continental and local churches, an attitude of which there seem to be few traces. Only under this condition, and only under this condition, we could speak for a truly global Catholicism in the world today. Here, uh, is a first question I would like to ask uh, uh, Jose, Jose Casanova. Coming to uh, the second point, I want to put on the table for the discussion. I would like to refer to Casanova's thesis that a global religious denominationalism has been developed in the contemporary world and which manifest itself in the fact that each world religion claim, claims it, its universal right to be unique and simultaneous different, thus asserting its particularism while at the same time presenting itself globally in a universal, universal path for all humanity, and which present itself as a self-regulated system of religious pluralism and mutual recognition of religious group in global civil society. If I have understood him correctly, Casanova seemed to tell us that religious, from the biggest to the smallest one, from the historical and to the newest ones, have learned the lesson of pluralism. The lesson of pluralism, adapting to live and function in, global, in the global world, in the open society, where multiple, multiple cultures and promises of salvation are present together. On the one hand, religion claims their own distinction, but without considering other religions as enemy or as false. In the other hand, they acknowledge that they were, were born in particular culture, or historical setting, but consider they offer to be uni universal. In this perspective, a global world system of religions emerges that is not only plural, char characterized by the simultaneous presence of people belong to various and heterogeneous religions in the world, but also pluralistic, recognizing that they are other religions, ideas in the world, beside one's own, that deserve respect. Within this framework, a system of mutual recognition of different religions emerges, 
within society and worldwide. In this framework, religions call upon the uh, political order states to be neutral to, towards all religion and ideologies in order to ensure pluralism. And in doing uh, this, the religions are congruent with the principle of religious freedom, the right of each individual to exercise his or her existential option. The thesis of global religious confessionalism, suggested by also, offer us many suggestions for our study, studies and researches, and thus it raises some questions. One could ask, for example, whether and how widespread is this self-regulated system of religious pluralism, pluralism and mutual recognition among religious groups in the world today, or whether it should be understood as the ideal endpoint or a desirable process. In thus, religious mature society, they are undoubtedly sign of this peaceful, peaceful religious climate. But in the global world, in general, the situation seems to be more controversial. Close to this, we could remind ourselves two points. Firstly, all uh, those, those uh, conflicts since a long uh, time uh, occurring within the Orthodox uh, Christianity and uh, which uh, still have uh, a key role in the war in Ukraine. And secondly, an ecumenism in the Christian world that today appears in trouble due to, to the te tendency of the three Christian denominations to put on the stage a strongly and foremost specific identity aspect instead of promotion, promoting a discussion on traversal and common traits. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Professor Giorelli, also for raising new questions to the main speaker. So I think that the discussion will be very, very interesting. Unfortunately, I will not be able to follow the conversation because, as mentioned at this point, I invite Professor Pace to take the chair and I wish all the best for the process of this conversation. So, uh, I invite uh, uh, Sinisa Zrinsak from University of Zagreb to comment the speech of Jose Casanova. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto, for this opportunity. And uh, first, I want to say that uh, I, what I like in presentation by Jose Casanova is a global overview in a historical perspective, which help us to sharpen our understanding and what is really going on. Looking in such a way, I think it's hard to question three global patterns which have been transforming Christianity, which <clears throat> uh, Professor Casanova underlined. First, it's globalization of religious communities. Second, emergence of religious pluralism. And third, global transformation in sexual mores. Still, I think it would be good at the same time to be aware of processes that maybe do not contradict global processes described by Casanova, but make them even more complex or more contradict just to not be sure in which directions we are heading as human. Therefore, my uh, comments are very particular as coming from post-communist European country, in which due to the communist legacy, the dissolution of the previous state and the war, the nationalist Catholicism is the main religion, the main religious force. I may be too much influenced by that, but that is the reality. And I think it's really important to set from which perspectives we are coming and uh, what we are talking, what, what we have intention to do. So first theme, first process, globalization of Christian religious communities. 
Let's look on globalization and on the Europeanization of Christianity in close connection to the de-globalization, post-colonialism, and the emergence of a new global political order. Let's start with de-globalization. The argument I want to put here is not that globalization is on reverse, though there are some signs for that. And not only that there is always a global local dynamic, localization, but the globalization is an overall frame in which decolonization is still evolving. Whether, is a, whether it is about the actual practice of decolonization or it is about long-term consequences of decolonization happened in the past. The fact is that decolonization, mainly visible as the nation state building process, means being against. Being against, I think it's an important driving force. It can be against Europe, against former colonists, against other religions, whatever. The question is how much importance, theoretically, we need to give to this driving force. This is even questioned by the concept of otherness, proposed as the main concept by the post-colonial theory. This concept of otherness tries to capture internal differences among those who colonizers simply labeled as other, as different, as a unique entity. Consequently, the concept of otherness tries to avoid Manichaean totalizing differences between us and them. However, if you want to correct the colonial experience, or put it sharply, the colonial excuse, does this imply that it is wrong to underline the power of being against in dealing, uh, in defining the identity of much of the post-colonial world? I would say it, that whether being more or less dominant, in the particular when and where a strong perception of threats occurs, the power of stating the power of stating the differences, and the power of an we can say identitarian against, rest as an important driving force in today's world. Religion is just a part of the game, but it's an important part. This relates maybe more to Catholicism and Orthodoxy than to Protestantism. As Casanova following Martin, Martin, David Martin, rightly pointed out that the global success of Protestantism relates to its lacking capacity to go native, to be local. The question is then, if and in which way Catholicism and Orthodoxy have become global, or have been still quite importantly rooted in a territory and specific culture. Drastic European secularization reveals this as a key issue. What we nowadays research as cultural religion or civilization religion is religion deprived of, of its religious meaning, but used as a memory reservoir for cultural identity of secularized Europeans, Canadians, Americans, whatever. In a more religious part of Europe, it is still a combination of religious meaning, political meanings, and social meanings of religion. The current Orthodox Europe is a good example of that, as from my point of view, the Russian aggression to Ukraine reforms conflicts between several Orthodox churches. Second, new global paradigm of religious pluralism. There are three interrelated principles Casanova underlined, religious freedom as an individual human rights, principle of a secular political system, which do not enforce or privilege any particular confession, and C, principle of mutual recognition of all religions. I will do here what I shouldn't do, and I will concentrate just on the first principle, the one about religious freedom as an individual human rights. Having a personal right is, from a historical point of view, a revolution which brought what is termed as a global human rights culture. I'm not, denying, I'm not denying that individual human rights is something which characterized the modern, postmodern social, social development. Similarly, I'm not denying that the human rights arguments have been the major driving force of many social movements, which can be changing societies profoundly. However, the problem is how to reconcile that with empirical evidence. Of course, there is a problem of how to measure human rights and how to measure the advancement of human rights, including religious rights. Still, there are empirical evidence that religious freedom has been still a very contested concept, and that whether we define it in this or that way, there is a high level of discrimination against religious freedom rights. The Pew Research Center evidence repeatedly warn us that governments' restrictions on religion have been rising globally. For example, 
57 countries in 2020 have very high levels of government restriction on religion compared to 40 countries in 2007. These restrictions have several forms, but include efforts by governments to ban particular religion, to limit preaching, or to give a preferential treatment to certain religious groups. More than 80 countries in the world have either an official state religion or a clearly favored religion. Are we witnessing an opposite trend? I don't know, but I have serious doubts. Though being, more, uh, though being more tolerant, Christian countries are not exception of that. It should be further investigated whether religious rights are more or the most contested among other human rights, and whether discrimination against religions, and in particular against religious minorities, is an outlier in a global surge of human rights. And what is usually neglected in studies about religious rights is the role of the states. In my very recently published paper on religion and politics, I argued that it is not, that it is not enough to employ otherwise illuminating concept of Roland Robertson of politicization of religion and religionalization of politics. It is important to look more deeply in how status and other secular actors define what is religion and what is not, and which religion have or do not have specific rights. Statists do that for a variety of reasons, but their impact of restric on restriction of religious rights is just remarkable, even in a secular so-called Christian Europe. Another aspect is that this should be connected to the rise of authoritarianism globally, regionally, and at the level of particular status. As social scientists, we paid much, much attention in recent years to the rise of populism and how populism use or misuse religion. As populism is mostly defined as a political style, the symbolic use of religion, even to define European secularism, is widely spread. That is why the concept of cultural religion has become increasingly present in the scholarship. However, I think we should, in this context, pay more attention also to the rise of authoritarianism as a preferred political orientation and to the rise of authoritarianism as a political regimes. Both variants of authoritarianism are connected and are clearly associated with the dissatisfaction with how democracy works, but are not the same. The question here is first, what will be the impact of these political trends to the respect of religious rights? And second, will these trends provoke global political recomposition of Christian religions that have yet to be investigated? Third, <clears throat> the issue about the moral revolution in gender and sexual morality. I will start here with research of values in my own country. In looking on changes, which is Croatia. In looking at changes of values in the period from 1980 to 2010, an interesting dynamic was observed. The parallel <clears throat> rise of religious conservatism and of gender equality, both. That had been happening during not only <clears throat> the rise of religiosity in 1980s and 1990s, but more importantly, at the time of public reappearance of religion, here Catholicism, Catholic Church, and the strong political and overall social role of the Catholic Church in the late 90s, the early post-communist time. An important part of that reappearance of public Catholicism was a very dominant narrative on traditional gender roles. <clears throat> this influenced also, not entirely, but in some important aspects, public policies, which aimed to reinforce the traditional division of labor between men and women. In some other post-communist countries, though not, not all of them, this was accompanied by a clear regression of women's rights. Still, on the level of attitudes, the Croatian example showed that the acceptance of gender equality and the promotion of modern non-traditional role of women had been arise in the same period. We can say so far so good. However, the fact is that this has been true for the whole population, not for the highly religious population. And this was and this fact was one of the main reasons for provoking social mobilization of traditional Catholics who have become publicly visible and very influential just in relation to the field of gender and sexual morality. Gender and sexuality have become the focal point of social mobilization for religious groups. It can be argued even that this is provoked also by sexual scandals of the Catholic Church 
Traditionalism is here against secularity, against moral relativism, and against the improper behavior of many church officials. Do not forget that, for example, many, for many populists who make reference to religion and base their view on a sharp differences between innocent people and sinful elite, the elite includes, in many cases, also the Catholic Church hierarchy. So social, such social mobilization based on traditional sexual morality and traditional gender roles, and I distinguish between the two, is happening throughout Catholic Europe, although it is more prevalent in Catholic post-communist country, Europe. Jose Casanova rightly pointed out that it is a question how long any religious tradition, particularly Catholic one, can resist the adoption of a new moral value when a near universal consensus concerning the sacred character of such a value emerges in society. <clears throat> I certainly <clears throat> do not know the answer, but what is empirically visible is that what can be labeled as a moral base of being religious today is maybe the only base left. Being religious is, at least in some part of the world, means belonging to the minority, and the issue is whether the social this social position reinforce the use of traditional morality as the only reference point left. This can be viewed as a part of what Norris and Eaglehart see as a cultural backlash, but it can be viewed also as a phenomenon per se, not only reinforced by the cultural backlash dynamic. I find an, an interesting parallel in a kind of strategy of churches to downplay religious voice in the public sector, for example, in the welfare sector, where there is not much difference, if at all, between religious and secular providers, in contrast to reinforcing the authority in other public issue. Just to further illustrate that, I'm currently co-editing a special issue of one journal on highly religious young Catholics in the world. We will have papers covering various countries and continents, but if someone would need to summarize very different studies, there is a strong commitment of young Catholics in different countries, in different social settings. <laughs> this strong commitment is something which clearly differentiates them from their peers, but also from their parents and in general from religious population. And commitment is both spiritual and social. And social include also public manifestation of traditional sexual morality. The position of such highly religious young Catholics in different parts of the world will not change the overall social and religious processes, but the impact of that on Catholicism and its role in the world remains, at least for me, unexplained. The final point I want to make here is the relation between sociology and Christianity. We, of course, know that sociology is deeply intertwined with Christianity since its birth, irrespectively of the way different sociologists and in particular founders of sociology looked at the religion. And besides saying that sociology needs to be less Western and less Christian in its theories and methods, there is no much discussion about that, although there is a clear move in relation to the various diverse topics studied. Still, there are two pressing tasks. The first is to reconsider the relation between sociology and Christianity <clears throat> in order to track not only historical but ongoing relations between the two. Do we still maintain strong boundaries or there is an influence in, in which way of Christian ideas to sociology and vice versa? The second is to look more which topics in transforming Christianity have remained unstudied, at least in terms of Catholicism, which I know a bit better than Protestantism and Orthodoxy, studying primarily individual religiosity and through the lenses of classical organization model seems to be too narrow. How people live religion and what is in general happening on the ground is much more complicated as we are witnessing a crowded and in many instances conflictual public arena with multiple voices. There is no one religion voice in the public arena from local to global, but there are multiple voices which need to be captured. Just cultural, political and technological changes are accompanied by a clear deconstruction of an old hierarchical model. This is also an essential part of transforming Christianity with a clear impact on how sociology should approach it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Jose, if you have uh, any comments, communication of the communication. You have, we have 10 minutes uh, for, for the... Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief. I know that we are pressed for time. Uh, ciao, um, Vincenzo. Uh, um, um, and so, uh, first, uh, thank you for two or three discussions. Uh, Blasi's comments, I see them simply as complementary to what I've said, uh, giving concreteness to what is a very abstract presentation of global trends. So I thank you, Blasi. I think that most of it basically fits very well with uh, within within my framework. So I didn't see any any conflict there. Uh, as to the questions of um, Franco, I think the first question uh, having to do with um, enculturation, of course, is the key question, how successful it has been. I don't know whether you're familiar, the last six years I've spent myself first studying the uh, uh, Jesuit missions, global missions, precisely because they developed a model of enculturation that ultimately was, of course, repressed by the Catholic Church. And we see it emerging in now, but by now it happens, the new process of indigenization happens after 200 years of Romanization. And so it's a very difficult question. I mean, Latin America is probably the most interesting case where these things are taking place, but also in Africa and Asia. And the last, again, the new book on Asian Catholicism and Globalization, which I've edited a big project with, with Peter Fan, will be coming out in a few months. So again, uh, uh, if I have, I have tried not to focus so much on Europe precisely because I think that we have to look well beyond, beyond Europe and these issues. But I agree with you that enculturation is a problem, that uh, the, even Pope Francis trying to bring it, you cannot bring it from above, you have to let it, and there is a lot of resistance to it. So a lot of resistance on all, on all fronts. Uh, the question on religious pluralism, the other question whether this is a a trend. Well, for me, the most important transformation has been Latin America. Latin America in 50 years has changed from being a Catholic continent to being one of the most religiously pluralistic in the world. It didn't happen without a fight. And this is the most amazing thing, how the, the pluralization of religion options in Latin America has become such a taken for granted phenomenon today. I've written also a lot on this. Uh, as to Cicina's uh, comments, I, I agree. It's a question of empirical uh, uh, analysis and where and when and how much how much weight do you give to uh, Eastern Europe as uh, setting global processes and how much and how much you look for other other instances. The question of authoritarianism, yes, obviously this is very much what this war in Ukraine is all about. Whether the the possibility of an alternative to the world order, as 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 Putin claims in, 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 in fusion with Russia and, of course, the BRICS. The BRICS, I always saw, is the most interesting phenomenon globally, also for questions of development, because all of them, with the exception of Russia, uh, actually Brazil, South Africa and India were, for me, the most interesting cases. Uh, uh, deeply pluralistic societies, religiously, uh, racially, uh, culturally, and yet, uh, unfortunately, they were—I mean, they were democratic societies. But in the last in the last years, all three of them had gone through a process of uh, authoritarian uh, implosion. Let's see what happens in Brazil. This may be critical for Latin America. And of course, neopopulisms were very much on the rise everywhere. Again, I've written on it. Uh, I think that that certainly for now, the war in Ukraine has put an end to them. We'll see what will happen in the future. Those, obviously, um, the, my presentation deals with long delay uh, historical trends and um, we'll see, probably we will not see 50 years from now, very few of us will be around to see whether any of these trends which have become globally uh, 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 crucial. Thank you very much. Please, Sergio. Very short. I'm Sergio della Pergola. Thank you very much, Professor Casanova, for your uh, paper. Um, very importantly focused, I would say, on the, on the public, on the global, on the macro dimensions of uh, 
of Christianity, and also thanks to the respondents. Uh, my um, question uh, is this. Uh, if I were an inhabitant of the moon landing at this conference, I would uh, ask myself, what is the actual contents of Christianity? What do they believe? What do they want? That is, the normative part uh, has not been really discussed, uh, which is, uh, I think, an integral portion uh, of, of the whole picture in terms of the personal, of the uh, more intimate core of beliefs. I, uh, of course, believe that there is a certain dynamics over time and uh, we certainly have empirical findings showing how this changes and also showing how this changes differently across the different denominations. And so I don't know if we have the time to uh, elicit from you a very uh, short just comment about uh, the actual contents of the theology of the beliefs. We have never heard, if I'm not mistaken, sorry to say this, the words Jesus Christ at this session this afternoon. And I thought this was quite fundamental. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Jose? Yes, obviously, this is not the place to develop now a credo. Uh, uh, the question of what the credo is and how it has been transformed and changed or how it's interpreted. I think that my my uh, points towards Vatican II and what Vatican II meant for precisely the reinterpretation, the understanding of what the tradition was. I mean, at least I pointed to this. But at the global level, this issue has to really, really study against ethnographically, empirically from the people. Of course, I could tell you what the Pope says, what I believe, but this is not the issue. Then you studied empirically particular Christian communities and you come to the to to the issue. Of course, what makes all of them Christian is the belief that Jesus Christ somehow is a unique event in the history of global humanity, the incarnation and the death and resurrection. This, of course, is taken for granted. Otherwise, you wouldn't have Christian communities. But then what does it mean and how then this is transformed into, into uh, uh, living in the world? This, again, a very, very complex issue that changes through times. I don't think that, that one can go beyond that. But I, but I could, say, could say the same thing about, about uh, um, Judaism. I guess uh, you, you could go through Judaism without discussing beliefs. But again, because there is not fundamental, what, what Jews believe is really not fundamental for Judaism. You have to enter into the practices and, and, and so on. And for each religion, then, what the specific form of leaf religion means uh, will go, will change. And obviously it changes from here, from region to region and from social class to social class. So anyhow, this, this is what I can say. Okay. I don't know if uh, from the remote there are some people who want to ask. No? No, okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Sinicia, Franco, and Tony. Uh, we have a very short break, coffee break, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, not more, because we have the final session of this. Prandi, uh, uh, Prandi, my God. <laughs> we have a question. Sorry, Carlo. Come fa? Deve attivare il microfono. Microfono, Carlo. No, please. I have nothing to say. Nothing to say. Okay. But I have nothing, nothing to say. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you, Carlo. Welcome. So, coffee break, please. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I have to travel to Washington now to another conference there tomorrow. See you. <laughs>